Uh, I didn't put it on here, but it's also cost a whole lot of money. Trillions of dollars. Trillions and trillions of dollars. So there's a couple of questions that I used to guide this session. Uh, one was, what is the war about? A second one was, are we dependent on foreign oil? The third one was, uh, what will happen if the U.S. leaves the Middle East or ends the wars? Uh, and then lastly, what does that mean for us? What should we be doing here at Occupy Boston? So just to begin with the first question, um, what is the war about? The war is, is about oil. Most people sort of have that vague understanding, but I want to take it a little deeper. Um, if you look at the graph, there's a pie chart which shows world oil reserves by region. And what you'll see is that the Middle East has more oil reserves than the rest of the world combined. I did, you said. That's only one thing. The question, though, is does the U.S. need this oil? People say, okay, yes, it's about oil, but doesn't the U.S. need that oil? Well, actually, according to the Energy Information Administration, the U.S. only gets 18% uh, of its imported oil from the Persian Gulf. 18% of imported oil from the Persian Gulf. But we consume not only imports, but also domestically produced oil, which means that uh, imports from the Middle East are actually less than 10% of the oil that we consume. So in other words, that's the march uh, that's coming in. They marched all over the city. They're now confronting the Federal Reserve Bank. Um, you know something? What I'm trying to say is that we're actually not uh, dependent on Middle East oil. It's less than 10% of U.S. consumption is actually coming from the Middle East. More, Af more oil comes to us from Africa than it does from the Middle East. But then you have to ask the question, if the U.S. is not dependent on Middle East oil, then why uh, does it want to control Middle East oil? Why is it so invested in this, this process of controlling the Middle East? And there, at the very bottom of your handout, People will listen. Well, we can do it again if we Let's need to. Do it again. Um, China is a big importer of Middle East oil. Uh, the EU is a big importer of Middle East oil. And Japanese, the Japanese support most of the oil from the Middle East. So if the US can control the Middle East, it can control all those other regions that depend on Middle East oil, like China, like Europe, and like Japan. And what it does is it basically has many military bases, it, it uh, supports dictatorships like the Mubarak regime that existed in Egypt until just recently, and it conducts these wars and occupations, wars in Iraq, wars in Afghanistan. Um, if you look at the, the information in the upper right corner on page two, upper right corner on page two, you'll see a, a chart that shows U.S. military aid to some regimes in the Middle East. Israel is the first one. Then Egypt, Bahrain, Yemen, Tunisia, Morocco. These are all countries that have had uprisings against U.S.-backed regimes. And so part of what we have to understand is that there's a direct connection between the uprisings that have now come to the U.S. and occupy Boston and the ones that started off there in Tunisia, and Egypt, and so on. Now the question is, what do Americans benefit from controlling this oil? Don't we all benefit in some way? And it's yes and no. The top 1% certainly does benefit from controlling the soil. ExxonMobil, Chevron, Shell, they make big money. In recent years, they've had record profits. On the other hand, the 99% of us who don't own those companies, uh, we have lost severely because of all the trillions of dollars that have been spent on them and not on our health care, not on our education, not on our housing. Also, we've been killing and dying. The people who kill and die for these wars are not the top 1%. Now, would there be chaos if the U.S. left the Middle East? There certainly would be trouble for the top 1% in this country who would lose their power, their profit, and their control over the Middle East. But I argue that that would be a good thing for us in the 99% and for the people of that region. Um, I'll just finish up because I don't want to speak for too long. At the very end, I just have, what do we do about it? What is the conclusion? which I would say is we need clear demands at this movement, things like ending the wars, bringing the troops home now, ending military aid dictatorships in the Middle East and around the world, 
And lastly, bringing all the war dollars home, bringing all of our money that's being spent to kill people for oil, that money should be spent here and invested in infrastructure and healthcare and education and jobs. So those are some demands uh, that I think we can use to talk to people in this movement. But I'll stop there, because I've been speaking for a long time, and I would like to offer you um, just a few minutes to talk about what I just said with the person next to you, and then we'll come back together and have sort of a share out and, and share ideas more, more largely. But I want to get people talking right away, so let's just take the next three to five minutes, uh, turn to a neighbor, and, uh, and talk. If you have a question, just raise your hand, and Marilyn or John or myself will come and check in with you. Sound good? Can I get a temperature check on that? Are people cool with that? Awesome. No, I agree with Hunchman. Well, we talked a little bit about the treatment of soldiers and the return. Uh huh. Um, and how they're often tricked into joining the army by taking to the lavish hotels and, and such. And that um, until recently, the mental health benefits have been so minimal um, that uh, there was a really high rate of suicides for young soldiers returning from Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh -huh. um, to be sure, can you it's hear, still can there. You hear? Oh yeah, oh yeah, still there, definitely. Yeah, that we kind of talked about that and some other things. About. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, well, um, my uh, what has always brought my attention with these wars is that um, both uh, weapon making and gas that goes into all the jets and the manufacturing of these weapons is it's big business. Yeah. Um, and uh, nothing. Just war is a business. Um, yeah. And if you look at it that way, we're able to understand yeah. Yeah. better uh, and yeah. maybe related more to what kind of benefits do we get or people get from being in war. Uh, also said that today I watched um, I watched Democracy Now! very often and today I watched the one from Friday and Amy Goodman interviewed um, this woman who is the movement for against, like, against the Taliban. Women organized against the Taliban. They hide, like they, they don't go out publicly. But uh, like she, she's also opposed to the Taliban. She's also a victim of, of violence and um, of oppression. Uh, but she wants the U.S. out, <laughs> nice. and that's interesting because uh, people in this country don't like increasingly don't want the wars. People in yeah. Afghanistan increasingly don't yeah. want the wars. Yeah. What of, is the U.S. doing there? Yeah. It makes no sense other than it is a good business. Yeah. It's a good business. Definitely. Kind of thing is to say that uh, you know the movement wants to uh, create um, you know more support for troops since we don't have a hand in policy perhaps and separate the two like they should be you know the person from the policy kind of thing and say you know what these are our brothers and sisters just like you and I you know we want the best for them just like you know they just have a really shitty job you know? worse than mine. The only way that any major change has made, been made has been through mass involvement and mass action and mass demands and taking power um, in, away from those who, who have it in their interests and, and forcing, forcing them to, um, to use that power for our interests. That's why we're here today. Um, and the same thing is true for the war. So we can't, and we can't, if we're for the, for the majority of people, then we, we have to take a stand against the wars as well as um, against Wall Street because they're integrally uh, connected and there's no separation between, they use war and, um, and weapons to maintain their power. Um, and that's where the money is going. I don't think people really in the United States understand how much money has been spent and will be spent on wars and how that directly impacts the fact that we don't have, in this wealthy country, we do not have educa free education, we do not have free health care, we do not, people are being kicked out of their homes, people, um, you know, don't have jobs. It's outrageous when you think about it, and, look, and it's our money, it's not even like they, the, the rich people's money is being spent for wars. You know, it's our money that's being stolen from us to pay their for wars, wars. for their wars. Um, there's 
since uh, September 11th, 2001, um, this is a modest um, estimate that $1.2 trillion of U.S. tax dollars have gone to wars. That's $1.2 trillion. This doesn't include the Pentagon's budget, which is an additional, uh, God, God knows how many billions trillions. of trillions. Um, which has increased by 81 percent, 81 percent in the last 10 years. These numbers are phenomenal, huh? 81 percent. Um, the wars, rather than decreasing and making it so-called safer for democracy, are increasing. There are more wars. There are threats of more wars. Um, we're using drones to kill people in all kinds of countries. Um, you know, nearly 6,500 U.S. service members have died, along with a thousand of our so-called allies. And you have, there's estimates that a million people have been killed in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and now, you know, and that's including because of sanctions and, and oppression um, and lack of, of health care and food and all the rest. That, um, you, you know, you had in Iraq, for instance, you had 10 years of, um, of war on Iraq really before we realized that there was a war going on. Um, people have said that, and there also this whole thing on war on terror. It's such crap because the war on terror is being used to justify a war to terrorize everybody forever. Um, and it's, it's a cover for being able to then scapegoat Im immigrants and to scapegoat Muslims and to go after dissidents um, here and around the world. So we really, um, these wars are so, it's so important that Occupy Boston and all of the people that are out in the streets now understand that our struggle is to end wars and occupations and to get our money back from there to satisfy their interests and, and use it for ours. There is plenty of money. We're, if we have trillions of dollars and are going into huge massive debt, sure. we have that money. All we have to do is use it for the people. I'm a Costa family. Some of you who know me, but my name is Carlos Arredondo. My son served two tours in Iraq. And he was killed at the age of 20 years old. We are Costa families. I mean, we lost somebody in, in the war. Absolutely. And we are, you know, we have been here every day. You see different displays. And I think it's very important to put together, you know, to support us. Just put the banner up there, you know, and you come yeah. along with, you know, Gostar families, veterans, you know, and other organizations. Yeah. And very important that, you know, the, yeah. you know, Iraq veterans against the war, they are here. Yeah. You this, know, military yeah. families picked out, yeah. they are here. Yeah. You it know, is, we have identified yeah. or do anything, but we've been around yeah. Yeah. making, you know, yeah. statements as well. So yeah. Yeah. I support you in anything I can myself. Yeah.